Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SAFE CPR Policy Web Seminar on the European Lessons from the Silicon Valley Bank Resolution. I would like to start by quickly um, present the people on the panel. So we have uh, Jan Kranem, who is the founding director emeritus of SAFE. We have Loriana Pelizon, who is professor of finance and director of the financial markets department at SAFE. We have Tobias Tröger, who is professor of private, commercial and business law, director of the law and finance cluster at SAFE, and also co-director of the Center for Advanced Studies for the Foundations of Law and Finance. We are uh, grateful to have two distinguished experts acting as discussant. We have Elke König, who until January was the chair of the Single Resolution Board and has now um, joined SAFE as a senior fellow. And we have also uh, Mr. Bini Smagi, who is the chairman of the board of directors of Société Générale. And my name is Florian Haider, and I am the scientific director of SAFE. So with this, I yield the floor to Jan Kran. Okay, thank you, Florian. And uh, welcome to this seminar. Uh, for, let's say, out of current uh, turbulences, we have decided to make this with a very short announcement to present basically um, some additional thoughts and discussions uh, about the, the lessons that one might draw, that we may draw from the Silicon Valley Bank resolution and also, of course, from the Credit Swiss case that was accompanying it in, in at, at time-wise. Let me start by... Um, uh, let me start by looking at the timeline, what we have seen in a very condensed form. Uh, if I look back, I would say in, uh, in, in the whole of last year, there has been an ongoing discussion about what the rise of interest rates might imply for banks and in particular for their asset holdings. And it, it was well known and observed by many that uh, between um, the bank book that may be accounting according to uh, holding to maturity uh, rules and uh, and the transactional account, uh, which has uh, the available for sales uh, idea of using market values for accounting, uh, that there is a discrepancy and that in some sense, if you are forced to realize uh, to, to sell or, uh, some of the securities in the banking book, you will realize losses. So you have unrealized losses. And these were, in a way, discussed a lot in the literature and in, in, in the press. On March 6, there was an explicit statement by the FDIC saying there are unrealized losses that have reduced uh, the equity of banks in the um, of uh, um, equity capital of banks in the financial system. So in a way, it was a warning signal. And, uh, and from, thou, from there on, I count the days. So plus two days means two days later. There were uh, recorded um, or reported losses at SVB at the Silicon Valley Bank of uh, two billion from the security sales. Uh, four days later, the FDIC and Treasury, together with the Fed, started to guarantee all deposits of um, the SVB Bank. Uh, and uh, on the same day, the Fed provided bank term funding. Um, uh, extraordinary uh, for extraordinary events uh, for up to one year to um, to all banks, and then uh, on the same day the FDIC took SVB in resolution. Another three days later, there was the message or the the um, the information that uh, one of the big owners of Credit Suisse was not willing to provide further equity, and one day later this bank needed uh, liquidity assistance of 50 billion by the Swiss National Bank. And another two days later, uh, this uh, liquidity assistance was increased to 100 billion, this time backed by the federal government. Uh, on the same day, several central banks decided to have big US dollar swap lines to basically um, strengthen the SNB as a backup for the Swiss banking system. And also on the same day, the UBS finally took over Credit Suisse again backed by some government guarantee. So that was basically the, the events that we went through very recently. And uh, uh, the, the question of interpretation is what have we seen here? 
And uh, the, the point that I want to make, uh, which is basically the starting point of our paper, is there are two banks with unprofitable business models, at, the, at least that's what we would judge uh, after the fact. They go into resolution or restructuring. Um, I think this uh, should be a normal exit experience, something that we see in all industries. Uh, of course, I put a question mark behind it because what we saw was something very different. What we saw was a, a very chaotic um, handling of the resolution activity under full one weekend stress. I, I, I'm writing here GFC style, so like in the global financial crisis, we were reminded of this, uh, uh, the, the emotions of that time. It was led, this whole uh, exit, by a team that uh, evolved the central bank and the treasury, so it was not done by market participants themselves. Um, it had uh, was accompanied by full protection of uh, depositors that were unprotected until then. And finally, uh, it was coordinated, um, there, there was coordinated central bank action in the background to basically stabilize the global impact of, of this uh, development. And the question that emerges is why do we see so much noise around something which seems to be a very natural event, a bank which is uh, has uh, has problems with the business model uh, just uh, uh, goes out of business, right? So where where is this uh, problem coming from? And our diagnosis in this paper is that uh, in both cases, uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, we have seen um, uh, acute bank runs that basically put the authorities under huge time pressure to uh, somehow contain the fire, so to speak, uh, because there was at least um, uh, imaginable a risk of spillover to uh, other parts of the financial system. So it was at least, uh, again, in the perception, uh, like a systemic event that justifies all sorts of measures, um, including state guarantees, deposit uh, protect, depositor protection, and, and even a uh, huge liquidity offering. Our conclusion uh, of this diagnosis is, um, if we want to allow um, an orderly resolution of banks under the in the current market situation, we should try to get rid of the run as the basically as the source of the chaotic um, trouble that we have seen, and we can achieve this by ensuring all demandable deposits of banks. Of course, not for free. Now we would do this at a fair insurance premium so that there are costs associated with the provision of this, um, this uh, uh, um, extended deposit insurance. And we would also imagine that moral hazard concerns uh, that, of course, uh, go hand in hand with deposit insurance can be dealt with by conditioning minimum loss absorbing capital to um, uh, to the um, um, uh, to the extent to which there are uh, demandable deposits on the bank's balance sheet, right? So you, we can have rising demands for equity and bail-in debt in this uh, case. I want to stress here that it's particularly important to have bail-in debt in this list because bail-in debt means that the primary market has to be tapped. Uh, and that is very important for firms to learn a lesson, so to speak, to pay the price of higher risk premium. Um, the European model of market discipline, to, because that's the, the essence of, our, our, of today's seminar, what can we learn in Europe? Uh, well, what we can certainly see that it's not working properly. Uh, uh, to, for today, there are many, many possible reasons, but in this particular situation of uh, these last couple of days, we can see a, a special issue um, that needs to be addressed. And, uh, and that is that um, the, the run basically hinders the execution of whatever living will you may have had in mind when you started resolution planning. Uh, what we also saw in the case of Credit Suisse is that bail-in is for real. So we have always uh, advocated bail-in is an important instrument in setting incentives, but we haven't seen bail-in happening so far. But in the case of Credit Suisse, 
although it's not part of the European Union, it nevertheless has a very similarly constructed regime. They have practiced it, and you can discuss how good they did the bail-in, but the, for me, the most important fact is that they did it. And so everybody else out there in the financial world has to take bail-in now for very serious. Um, so our, our suggestion is to make it easier to resolve a bank by basically getting rid of the, the type of sudden bank run that we have seen in these both cases. Uh, as, as something like a, like a final point, we want to say that uh, we, we easily and readily uh, concede that the European model of market discipline is far from being first best and uh, the, the optimal model one could think of. But in the real world, with political interferences uh, and with many countries being involved, uh, this is probably the best one we could think of so far. And so everybody who criticizes our approach should have a better one, uh, a better model in, in mind. I conclude, conclude with looking at this slide, which gives us the, the bail-in hierarchy, just to pointing out where the types of uh, additional bail-in is, uh, sorry, uh, uh, deposit protection is to be expected. So if we go to the lower part of the slide, we see deposits above 100,000 euros. So they should be protected to the, to the extent that they are demandable deposits. And also from the senior preferred debt, it would be the deposits from large business, which also would be protected because we don't see them as part of the uh, tailored and designed market discipline uh, instruments that uh, the BRD is, um, is uh, suggesting with uh, bail-in instruments. All right, so let me summarize uh, in listing the three no's that we want to um, advocate. Namely, we should have no run by extending the coverage of the deposit insurance. We should have no subsidy by pricing deposit insurance uh, uh, in, a, in a proper way. So that liquidity, that is what banks can offer to firms and other uh, people uh, has its real cost. And finally, we don't want to enhance moral hazard. So we think that um, uh, the absorb loss absorbing capital should be basically be conditioned on the bank risk-taking behavior and also on the amount of de uh, deposits that are being protected. I conclude, oh, this is my last slide, so thank you. Thank you, Jan, for presenting our proposal um, for a better regulated and more sustainable financial system. And with this, um, I move on to our first discussant, Ms. Elke König. Thank you, and I am just thinking how to start because no one can be against trying to find a solution where you won't have a run. No one is against a system where you won't have moral hazard and where you won't have to use the taxpayer basically to backstop. But I think if I look at Silicon Valley Bank and the lessons learned, I would go one step back. I think it's clear that this was a failure of the bank's management. They took bets on their uh, duration mismatch. They took a very difficult decision or a very interesting accounting decision to uh, for their uh, assets held to maturity for assets that are in principle high quality liquid assets. You ask yourself how can this really match and the like? And of course, it was also to that extent, probably not a failure, but at least there were shortcomings in supervision. Did supervisors really stress test liquidity sufficiently? Did they really focus on the impact of fast rising interest rates? I think the main narrative here has always been also in Europe that of course, rising interest rates are good for the banks, fully agreed long-term, but you need to come from here to there and your assets might suffer more than you can really adjust on the liability side, which also leads to the question, did the supervisors adequately reflect the accounting? I would call it even malpractice here, because when you look at Silicon Valley Bank, 
and you take the whole to maturity uh, portfolio into consideration, then basically the solvency was already gone end of last year, not only in March. It was, they had more than 30% of their assets in hold to maturity and they were deeply underwater. So the question there is, have they really addressed those topics when you read the testimony of Michael Barr and Martin Green, uh, Greenberg, you would say, yes, they have addressed it, but they were probably too patient and we could go probably for different reasons for the same for uh, Credit Suisse. I think in the banking union, we have one big advantage. We cast a broader net. We have tighter supervision and resolution of this kind of banks than in the US. But clearly, we can do better. And I think here, it's also a strong reminder that we need to very much look into the various business models. Lessons for resolution, quite a lot. And the main lesson is actually on, was on your first slide. You saw in this case that the withdrawal of deposits happened with lightning speed. It was no longer like in, Black, uh, in Northern Rock that you saw people queuing in front of the branches. They did it with a click on the laptop, probably in between a discussion here and there. There was very much social, me social media or actually media coverage. In the case of Credit Suisse, you had the feeling that reading the FT, you were sitting at the, at the table in deciding. So are resolution authorities nowadays prepared for this? Can we really decide that fast? For me, is a question. I would disagree with you that this was chaotic in the case of Silicon Valley. I think it was remarkably organized still within the, uh, the, uh, the US system where you need at some point treasury and the central bank to decide on significance and all of this. But clearly it puts the question out, why did we go this way? And I would also try to, probably in my past uh, uh, position to say, it was not proof that resolution will never work. No, with the fact, the fact that we have in Europe Emerald, that we have resolution plans was making it far more organized than it would have been beforehand. And those were both very idiosyncratic cases. So for me, the question when it comes to how to avoid a bank run is probably like going, to, like in any question, precaution and trying to have a very responsive supervision, which I hope we have, and I think we have, is the first part. Does it really make sense to provide all demand deposits with a, a guarantee? Does that solve the problem? I don't think that you can really contain the moral hazard problem. And I read quite a bit in the US, at least the idea, well, you might need this kind of overall safeguard for a transitional period. Here I would just ask, and when do you get out of it again? It feels a bit like all this kind of either you have it longer term or not, because you will always find a reason why you can't terminate it today. So for me, the question is, it clearly makes sense to think about protecting, how to protect and how to basically enact the, the fact that you want to protect at least transactional accounts of companies, but where do you put the line between the transactional account and what you had in uh, Silicon Valley Bank, basically giant demand deposits, which were not necessary for just paying the next uh, wages and the like, but they were smart investors just parking the money. So I don't think that we really have a have a real solution there and we need to somehow distinguish because otherwise you will see also something that we saw in the recent years. We saw that depositors during the low interest uh, environment started to spread their funds across Europe in search for yield. And they did so in fully building on the insurance 
Pretty, it was always you go until 99,999. So you take a free ride on the system. Don't worry, be happy. So I think I see a problem there. I full heartedly agree with you that if you go that way, you need to redesign the fees for deposit insurance and you need to reshape, in any case, the TLEC or in our case, the MRO system because clearly you need high quality subordinated debt. Your equity will unfortunately be gone at the point of no return. So there is a lot to come. And I think for me, the, more uh, the part which you didn't mention, but which was always on my wish list is in both cases, you see that regardless of the solution, you need a credible liquidity backstop. And the liquidity backstop we have with ELA in supervision, in, uh, in going concern, might have to be rethought. But definitely, we need to add a liquidity backstop for resolution because we don't have it yet. Sorry for being a bit too long, but I think the cases are, and there I full heartedly agree with you, Jan, there is more to be considered and lessons to be taken, though I would at the same time say our European system is a bit, uh, probably not the same as in the US. For example, the idea to go beyond, uh, be, uh, to only look at banks with a balance sheet size of 250 billion, there was a right to look at banks with 100 billion plus, it was just not, used at that time. So that could be a long story. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for these uh, for these insights based on, on your tremendous experience in the practice of uh, regulating and supervising banks. Uh, now I would hand over to uh, Lorenzo Binismaghi to give us maybe the view from, from the practitioner. Thank you. Well, uh, from, from the private sector, maybe. And um, I have uh, difficulties in, in finding uh, ways to disagree with Elke um, in, in the sense that uh, we, we all agree that there were managerial problems uh, that have been mentioned, um, even the business model, um, a bank which doubled its balance sheets, I think in, in a couple of years or in three years, fast growth, uh, 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 problems of supervision that were mentioned. Now, then we move to the assessment, which was that the bank was, I wouldn't say unprofitable, because you know you don't want to resolve unprofitable banks. I mean, you know, at least that are that banks that are insolvent. And and um, do you need a, a bank run? To realize that you have to resolve a, a, an insolvent bank, and that's that's the big issue, uh, I think, because the rest, I mean, we had contagion, but I, I don't think you you are addressing this specific issue because the contagion did not really happen to bank runs. You had, you could say that you had a bank run in a few regional banks in the US, but not, not in the rest. Actually, you had money moving from the regional bank to the, uh, the largest banks in the US. And in Europe, you, you really didn't have a, a bank run. So, so what, what we want is to be able to resolve an insolvent bank without having a bank run. So addressing a solvency problem without having a liquidity problem. I I, I, th I don't know. I think this is impossible. Uh, it's impossible, uh, uh, I think, for a supervisor to tell a bank you are insolvent um, and take this this this, this case. Uh, I mean, I, I would like to know what what Elke think about that. Um, you know, especially a listed company. Uh, I I I think it would be it would be. I mean, even if even if it happened. Even if you, you know, you, you guarantee deposits, an insolvent bank at some point 
uh, uh, has to, to get into liquidity uh, problems, maybe to other parts of the, uh, of the layer B. So <clears throat> the question is, we have a, a proposal um, to, to try to, to limit bank runs uh, through insuring uh, the uh, large deposits. And I think the, the question is, um, what, what, are, what are the impact of these measures? Are we sure we do not uh, produce collateral damage uh, rather than, um, rather than uh, addressing uh, the, the problem in a different way? And I think uh, Elke mentioned it. Interestingly, uh, the uh, liquidity support for the bank was not available to the Fed due to uh, post-crisis limitations. I mean, the Fed could uh, uh, do the lender of last resort to the banking system as a whole, but not to specific banks, because this power was taken away mm -hmm. by I mean, th these are you know, some of the consequences of over-regulation uh, or over-deregulation, I mean, or, or uh, erratic regulation. But if I look at the specific issue, uh, <clears throat> Uh, specifically, um, if we extend the deposit insurance uh, scheme too much, um, especially to large corporates, I mean, is this fair? Is this fair to, you know, uh, these large corporates in the case of uh, SVB, I mean, you know, some of them were shareholders were, I mean, they had probably inside information. And that's why they ran away. Uh, uh, so, I mean, if you if you look at, at large corporates, I mean, the, the, the treasury the treasury department of these institutions are are generally very equipped, and they have a dialogue with the bank. They generally discuss the conditions, and they generally get also good remuneration. So, why why do you want to protect these people? It's not it's not clear. Why do you want the taxpayer uh, or the small depositors to pay for these people? I, I don't think it would be equitable. Um, what's the impact of this on the other uh, uh, liability issue? We are in a post, uh, post Credit Suisse uh, uh, situation where the future of 81 uh, 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 assets are, are being discussed. I mean, what would be the future of, of these others when, when you segment uh, the market even more? Um, then there is the, I mean, you know, some of these, of the problem like efficiency, who pays and how much pays is left, is left uh, a bit undetermined. I mean, yeah, you can say, you know, don't, don't uh, uh, have it paying too much, but still, uh, it's, I think that the formula would be very difficult. What then, you know, uh, what's the credibility also of the measure? Uh, if in the end, the backstop, of all this in case of a systemic crisis is, is the public sector. Is it credible uh, to have a backstop for ensuring all deposits uh, beyond a certain level? In the end, what would be the impact on, on, on the, the, uh, the public debt? So, uh, and in the end, will the guarantee be sufficient in case in which indeed it is insolvent, the bank is insolvent? to uh, avoid uh, a bank run or a deposit withdrawal. So um, in the end, I, 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 I have some, I, first, I, I think we're still at an early stage of understanding what really happened, taking all the lessons. And I would really caution against, you know, um, saying uh, everything is wrong or, you know, uh, on the one side, I think uh, Europe, uh, so far has held well. Uh, second, uh, having very punctual, very specific measures to address a very complicated uh, uh, crisis. I think one has to look at, you know, at the general equilibrium, I would say, impact uh, that this would have on the whole system. Uh, so I, I would be very cautious to, you know, to have strong views, at least, let's say, at this stage. And I, I would cautious Again, you know the collateral uh, uh, impact, uh, the side effects uh, of, of of similar measures. Uh, 
I, I think in, in the end, what you really need is a well-balanced uh, uh, asset liability management and, um, and trying to, uh, to address the issue ex ante rather than, than, than ex post. Um, I, I am not sure that concerning uh, Europe, uh, the, uh, we would have gone the same way as, as the Swiss or as the, as the US. I think to some extent, the Swiss and the US had to go this way because of the problems ex ante. Uh, they didn't provide lender of last resort because they couldn't. Then uh, ex post, uh, to reassure the market, they had to provide lending to everybody even, even more than, than with the usual uh, budget uh, 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 pro provisions. So, so they, they, did, they had to overshoot ex post uh, because they, had, they undershot ex ante. So we shouldn't ask ourselves in Europe, are we able to overshoot uh, necessarily? Because I, I'm not sure that this is, is the right answer, but I've also been too long maybe, and uh, I give back the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Vini Um We'll we'll now have a quick uh, round of responses from from the authors of our policy brief. But I would like to remind uh, everybody that uh, you can enter your questions in the Q and A, and we have some time set aside to uh, to respond to those. So please uh, do uh, do feel free to uh, to ask us questions. Um, now I'm turning to uh, to Jan, Loriana, and Tobias. Uh, would you like to uh, single out a couple of points that are of these many good points that are that are worth a a, a, a more detailed response? Maybe I Loriana. Go, I go. Oh, sorry. No, no, I, I I go last. I say that. Let others speak. Okay, then let's start with Loriana. So thank you very much. And I think that uh, the point rise are, are uh, very interesting. I want just to, to, to stress one aspect that it has been uh, uh, highlighted that, uh, you know, is it fair to provide insurance to large corporates? They are able clearly to read better than uh, many others, uh, the balance sheet of banks, and uh, they are really good in managing usually their treasury. And clearly, I'm in line with this view. On one side, this thing that they will be the first one being able to run uh, a bank if there will be some issue in terms of, uh, uh, of um, let's say, solvency of this bank. So on one side, they will be indeed the one that uh, have the, um, let's say, the knowledge and the incentive to run first as soon as there is some problem. Second, if they are not doing it, we need to consider also that they will be then the one that we can consider the too big to fail. So if there will be indeed a, a, a default and this, let's say, deposit will be bail-in, they will be the type of companies that may be uh, for some other political reason we need to save because otherwise there will be a contagion. So I think that uh, indeed because we need to use a general equilibrium perspective, when we are distinguishing the, uh, the depositors on whom we are going to insure and the other that we are not, we need in, indeed to consider all these other aspects on top of the fact that uh, they are large and smart and they have all the capacity to understand what is going on. So this is one of the points, but then uh, maybe I will add uh, something else, but I'm happy to leave the space now to Tobias. Yeah, uh, thanks, Loriana. Just, uh... A little bit in, in line with what you said and what also Eke Koenig addressed. So I think these transactional accounts and large deposits are a matter of concern. And we don't want them to be runnable. And there are several ways of doing it. But one aspect is, I think, critical that we also, in our proposal, look at a uh, bank's balance sheet in a way that they don't amass these kinds of positions on the balance sheet. So clearly, supervision has to also look into this more thoroughly whether they, exactly these positions are, you know, piling up on a balance sheet of a bank. So that's certainly one point. And just to react quickly to something that Lorenzo uh, Vinismagi said, um, there are clearly uh, the fiscal capacity that is in, uh, backing our, our idea is a matter in their historical examples like Ireland where public finances were ruined through backstopping a banking system, but of course, ideally designed 
And that is something that I think is quite important, a credible deposit guarantee, whatever of whatever size, uh, if it's credibly designed, uh, is never drawn. So in a sense, the, 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 the risk for actually the fiscal capacity might be lower in reality than uh, it looks like if we extend the deposit guarantee scheme. Jan? Yeah, so I um, have three short remarks. The first one to Elke Koenig, um, how to avoid a bank run. Um, uh, and we can't contain moral hazard if there is um, if there is enough depositor protection. That was one of, of the statements. So we need in okay. the bank run to somehow control moral hazard. I would... I would try to disagree with this view because with a lot of thinking, we have developed uh, the idea that loss absorbing capital should be of a nature that makes market discipline and that, that means anti-moral hazard uh, uh, work possible. All right, so the whole work on bail in uh, um, debt is really about comp banks tapping the market frequently paying the price that the market currently charges given the risks that they are taking and and potentially making it impossible to access the market and thereby uh, basically driving the company the bank into into um, into uh, decreasing or even closure right so i think that's the idea behind the brrd that we bring market discipline in a very put in a very i would say organized and protected way to play right and it's not this random um evo uh, development of the run that brings us discipline because that is very costly it has spreading power it has systemic risk dimension which is that was my initial statement in the presentation we have two institutions some one a bit smaller, one a bit bigger, but they want to leave the market because they don't find their good business model. And they can only do it if the whole world holds its breath. Come on, this can't be that can't be the future of banking, right? That will be the, the end of banking the way we, we know it, I think. Um, my, my second point, collateral damage, absolutely important and, and closely related to, to what I what I just said. Um, Lorenzo, you main, you mentioned the it's not equitable that small depositors pay for uh, large companies so that they have liquid liquidity guaranteed. Well, in our model, they wouldn't because they would be charged for that. It would be there would be a price for that. Of course, the bank has to pay, but uh, they would uh, they would bring this to to uh, to their clients one way or the other. Uh, so it should be a, uh, an insurance model. And of course, you have to pay the, the insurance fees in terms of low returns, right? And we, we realize that zero return on deposits, on demand, demandable deposits, given that they are safe, may be still a good return uh, relative to the 4% we get on a money market fund, which is not protected right? and, and which has other risks that, that they bear. And, and my last point is um, uh, the backstop um, uh, may may uh, arise uh, may, may arouse uh, uh, fairness considerations, but we should not forget that for the big depositors there is an implicit guarantee. Right? This implicit guarantee always comes to to the forefront when we look at a particular case, be it SVB, be it CS. Immediately deposits are protected ex post, right? and so there is an implicit guarantee, and people can count on it and they can work with it. And I would just like to see this become explicit and, and priced, of course, right? And then anticipated in, in that sense. Okay. Thank, Thank you, uh, Jan, uh, Tobias, and, and Loriana. Um, as the Q&A is, uh, is filling up with, uh, with interesting questions, I, I propose to uh, move on and pass some of those questions on to, uh, to the panelists. So, um, one question that comes from uh, Mathias de Vatripon. Um, he's, um, he's pointing out that with uh, in insuring deposits, uh, banks, there's a danger of banks to grow and where and how and if to limit that, that you know, making the too big to fail problem even worse. Should it be through what Jan mentioned, maybe some concentration limits, 
Should it be through more uh, uh, requiring more MREL, TLAC, um, or should it be through uh, through other forms, maybe making the insurance more expensive? Um, what, what are our views here? Who, who wants to speak? Well, I can I can speak, but you know it was already stressed. I think several times it is in the document and also by by Jan on the fact that we are not just uh, you know suggesting a deposit insurance for. Uh, all the deposits without uh, any other measure uh, together. So clearly moral hazard has to be prevented. And clearly we consider different type of, uh, of aspects. On one side, you know, indeed uh, also larger, let's say either capital or subordinated debt as a guarantee. On the other side, a larger deposit insurance. On the other side, uh, maybe, you know, uh, some uh, analysis and some penalties regarding concentration. So all these other things has to be considered together because clearly we are aware of the moral hazard that is present by, by deposit insurance in general and clearly if it is a, a extended even more. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, so we, we think to both. So uh, the deposit insurance as a measure and also all the other, let's say, uh, penalties that uh, will uh, prevent the moral hazard. Yeah, yeah. If if I can add one 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 remark, I think the um, the a, a new regulation with all the large deposits being insured would in some way produce a price for entering that system, a price for liquidity, and uh, that would hopefully limit. Um, the the extent to which balance sheets grow, of course, the as the aspect that Matthias is 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 mentioning is important, but I wouldn't relate this directly to the the question whether we want to have a run or not to resolve a bank. Right, so these are two different issues, and we might have two instruments to deal with them um, separately. So, and so pricing is of course one one aspect. One one uh, final remark in this direction. So I think. Um, if it's uh, a well-priced deposit insurance, there is no incentive to take in more and more insurances. It's not necessary that uh, banks are definitely automatically growing if it's not a cross-subsidized refinancing option. And that's exactly what we want to avoid. And then I think the, the growth perspective is not necessarily one that we should be too worried about. Um, uh, Ms. Koenig, you have a reaction here? Yes, I try to react here. I think I agree that there is an inherent danger that banks might grow fast, but this is foremost a question for supervisors, and I think Lorenzo pointed out to this too. A bank that grows uh, or doubles its volume in three years, a bank that has a very peculiar business model, ex ante needs to be supervised and needs to be monitored and not to wait ex post. But I wanted to react also a bit to uh, Jan, to your comment. I don't think that I was would like to be quoted saying that a bank run needs to be there to contain moral hazard. My problem is rather, if I guarantee all deposits, I open up to free riders. And I full heartedly agree, we need to safeguard household deposits. We need to expand this to transactional accounts. But do we really need to safeguard Peter Thiel? So just to use a name, do we really need to make this a system where if you move your money fast enough into deposits, into demand deposits, you're safeguarded. And I think there, the idea that you can manage this via pricing is just one element. And I agree, it needs to be the MRAL consideration. It needs to have a very tight net into supervision. And I see practically more concern than I really see answers at this place. And the very simple point is the European system has already the chance to carve out more than just protected depositors. But this also needs to be implementable over a weekend. The weekend is a very short period. And if you then figure out that already a single customer view seems to be stretching some bank systems, then to decide to which extent you want to cover the demand deposits and where do you want to stop. 
is probably a very difficult argument. I don't think that the U.S. took a deliberate decision and were happy to guarantee oil depositors. It was just a stopgap at this point in time. And some they hopefully don't repeat. But that's my personal view. Uh, Mr. Vinny Smagi, do you have a reaction to that? Or um, yeah. because we have a couple of other questions, may no, maybe quickly? I, I feel... Uh... I fail sometimes to be to understand the economics. I mean, uh, 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 the case of SVB was a case in which you had some companies having a lot of cash, wanted to have a lot of cash, eh? and instead of uh, investing in government bonds who were who had the higher returns, deposited on the banks. Why? Because that was available. Actually, I think for the uh, the specific mm -hmm. company who had uh, a crypto that was required to have uh, uh, deposits. So now, <clears throat> uh, so they prefer to have deposits rather than a higher interest rate. Now we guarantee even these deposits. So uh, this will lead even more people to get out of the bond market and deposit because this is uninsured. And, uh, and then uh, what will the supervisor do? They will go to the company and say, look, maybe your asset liability measure is not that good. But the, the, the bank will say, well, but they're insured. So they will stay forever. By the way, this is the basis for the savings and loan crisis. Uh, basically, they were taking too much, uh, I mean, uh, uh, imbalanced risk because uh, uh, credit, uh, uh, interest rate risk because they thought everything was guaranteed. So, uh, uh, frankly, uh, you know, you have to look at the whole system by looking at the elasticity of substitution and what do you get out of it. I think if you guarantee everything, there will be even more deposits and. I'm not sure that this is the right way to go, not because of the size of the banks, because that's not the, 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 the whole issue, but it's for the efficiency of the system and the right incentives. I think good asset liability management is, is, is what you need and avoiding concentration of, uh, of risk. That, that's, what, that's what you need. And incidentally, Very good. Uh, sorry. I want to mention that, uh, to, I mean, we, we live a bit in the illusion that markets are disciplining. Um, you know, uh, frankly, you know, markets may discipline at times and, and they may not in other times. And, you know, history is full of this. If you try to issue today a bond with markets which are closed, you know, uh, you just cannot. So you will say that they are disciplining banks. And, you know, if some, if some banks have to issue bonds over the next couple of months, even the most solvent banks, would have huge problems. So, you know, we have to have a, 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 a more, a less theoretical model, I think, uh, of, of, or at least looking at extreme cases to, to you know, to, to avoid thinking that the market's discipline and, and corporate's wrong. Thank you. So let me actually, for, for practical, you mentioned the issue of, of practicality. And so Thomas Quetas asked a very practical question for us in Europe is can we can we address the the issue with our current national deposit insurance schemes or do we need a more european uh, a solution to avoid also cross arbitrage across uh, you know across um, national banking sectors and let me tie this in because we had a couple of other questions that i think fit this topic is to what extent would a european or national uh, uh, supervisor resolution uh, uh, part of the resolution authority have the guts to close down a bank when push comes to shove will they will they will they have the guts to do what the what the what the swiss did or are already some of the banks too big to resolve what do you mean by the guts of doing what the swiss did i mean frankly um the disgrace of doing what the swiss did or I'm I'm just repeating I'm just repeating the questions of the chat. Um, ah, okay, so um, so this is <laughs> this, but I guess the interpretation is that um, I mean you put I, you know I don't want to put anyone's words in the mouth but you could interpret that it took some courage to write down uh, the the bailable bonds and it took. Uh, also, maybe some guts to expropriate uh, the equity I don't holders. Any, any guts because the government would have never been able to to put the money in. Uh, uh, the taxpayer would have killed the, the government. So, so I, I frankly, you know, uh, 
one could say that uh, uh, the, the ranking could have been diff different, but the alternative would have been to nationalize Credit Suisse. And I, I don't see that many governments that would have uh, the, the, the stupidity in Europe to doing that, uh, if the alternative is possible, of course. Um, but um, what, what you could say is that you don't always have a national alternative. So to the extent, uh, and here uh, I, I defer to, to Elke, uh, whether uh, in Europe, uh, if you don't have uh, an obvious alternative within member states, some countries would become uh, nationalistic and would not want a, a foreign solution, or I mean, a, a non a European, but non, non national solution. And they would oppose this to the point of, of putting public money. So a country with a big bank would say, I, I don't want a solution like the Swiss because it would involve a, non, a foreign uh, a bank. And I prefer to, to put public money in, but that would be in violation. I think, you know, I, I don't know how the S, S, uh, uh, SRB would, uh, would address this. I see that Just also. Kidding, yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me try. Yeah, I because the SRB was mentioned, so. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I then I was wanted to be yes. The SRB is by, by today led by Dominique Labourec, so for the SRB, he would have to answer. But let me go back a bit in history. And let's be clear the solution in the US, so Silicon Valley Bank, was within the US system a resolution. Would it have been very much different in Europe? In principle, no. If this, this bank was failing, it was insolvent, it was or failing or likely to fail, and we would have had to resolve it. My major concern is seeing the speed of that transaction compared to that Banco Popular, which was a resolution case, was a very slow moving case already and we thought it was very fast so i think uh, of course the srb or the european resolution authority will have to react will it be solutions where you then could be blamed afterwards that you found a national buyer and the like all can happen but i don't see any reason why you wouldn't say yes there would be a resolution. The case for Credit Suisse was different. It was, in the end, uh, I would call it a orchestrated private solution. And I agree with Lorenzo. The alternative, probably at that point, would have been to either nationalize the bank or to try to really slice and dice it over time. And this was too late. So the solution should rather, the argument should rather be how well prepared are we? Do we have all the tools that we have within our toolbox really implementable? Have the authorities acted at the right point? And just to remind us all, if I'm not mistaken, the solution that Swiss uh, Credit Suisse had in its own mind was in case of resolution, they will spin up the Swiss private banking operation. Not doable over the weekend. So not a real resolution decision. But I would not put into question the basic will and the ability to act. And we are talking in both cases about banks that would have been under the SSM and the SRB, so not in the national remit. Thank you very much. Tobias. Just, uh, just a quick response, because the panel seems to be raving about the great things that the Swiss have been doing at Credit Suisse. Um, I would caution that a little bit, because you know what we saw is essentially a purchase and assumption resolution strategy, which is always nice to do if you have the private sector backstop. And then, you know, bailing in, uh, technically it's not a bail-in, but, you know, uh, writing off 81 uh, is also not super courageous, right? Because that's exactly what 81 is supposed to do. And therefore, you know, do we learn much about whether Balin is functioning or not in the current Swiss case? I would be cautious because it is, again, a very idiosyncratic case where you have private sector backstop available, where there are still government guarantees quite pre prevalent in the, in the scenario. 
and you don't touch anything that is junior to 81. So that's not really super courageous, I think. Thank you, Tobias, for putting a little perspective uh, uh, on the Swiss case. I think we have time for one more uh, complex of questions. And um, I, that means I will miss out a couple of very interesting questions um, in, in, in the, from the Q&A. So for example, is the role of accounting. But there's one question that I would like to give some room to because I think it really has a bit of a novel aspect that hasn't really, one hasn't been able to see much in the news about. And there's a question about, and it was mentioned a bit, um, the, the role of, of media and social media, because I think that's something very different from 15 years ago. The role of technology, social media, maybe even some digital forms. Is there, do, do we need, the question is, do we, see, do we see a role for science communication to give an objective account of risks and development? Is there something that the, the supervisors could learn is transparency the best disinfectant? Is it is it too much? Um, what are the views in the panel on this? Well, if, if I can give a, a make a start, uh, my my first intuition when I when I thought about this was this has made the the run and everything you do against it into something that happens instantly. So we we have to in a way remodel this. It's not a process. It's not a cue. It's not a, something that happens over time. It ha happens in a, in, a, in a second. So the arguments that we try to bring in this paper are even more important in a world where communication is so fast, where whenever there is ambiguity, you have potentially a run risk because people move it because they are in doubt. Moving is fast, is almost costless. And if you have a very sophisticated financial uh, a treasurer, then you 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 have to do this uh, in in light of the uh, of the safety of your company, and and in that respect, we we should be more aware of run risks than rather than less, and and that's in in a way the direction we are pushing the whole discussion. If I can take an opposite view, mm -hmm. uh, I I think I mean if if you look at at the data, I mean Credit Suisse were, was a slow a slow run, which accelerated at the end. I, I think a, anybody would uh, agree that, you know, the supervisor was slow and, uh, and, 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 uh, and th this was, you know, like, like a, a cargo slowly going direction. In, in the SVB case, was it really social media? I, I think we still don't know, but I have the impression of, you know, there's some like some, something of a uh, inside information. I mean, how many players were there at stake? I think in the end, very few. Um, and, and they were determined. Few big players. And I think that's uh, 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 probably, the, I, I don't know how many depositors were able, uh, uh, retail depositors were able to exit, really. It, it was a game of the big. So um, here, I, I, I don't know if there will be a judicial inquiry. Uh, of you know what these guys uh, did and knew that others did not know. Maybe here I would say paradoxically one could say it's a failure of social media, it's a lack of transparency in, in, in SVB. Uh, probably when SVB tried to increase capital, they went first to these treasurers and they revealed some of the potential losses. Um, I don't know, let, let, let's see what will come out from the inquiry. Okay, last word belongs to uh, Ms. Koenig. No, uh, I think uh, <laughs> I agree with Lorenzo. We need to be mindful. I was mentioning social media because I was really puzzled over the weekend. Reading FT, you felt had the feeling you were sitting at the negotiation table. This is clearly something to be considered. But at the same time, what we saw in uh, SVP, B was probably more that you had a few very knowledgeable investors that drove this. And then you get into the situation, you withdraw first, you ask questions later, and therefore the run risk. Do we really, how to solve this and how to address it in action? Probably, and I think Lorenzo, you mentioned that in the beginning, ex ante addressing 
situations that pile up earlier, more forceful, could have helped. Was it too slow? I think in both cases, also the supervisor was too slow. SVB, when you look at the numbers, when, you, when they tried to do the rights issue, people realized that they had hidden losses, which were already making them balance sheet insolvent. And end of the year and not afterwards, just due to the accounting effect, this was not really reflected. So I think this is something that needs to be addressed first. Can we, well, for social media, for media and also for the technology, we just need to, to acknowledge that things are faster than they have been 15 years ago. And there's a difference between household deposits and corporate deposits. Because we have Lorenzo here who is ideally suited, I think, to answer this question that popped to my mind. I mean, wouldn't you say if the prospect of a unsustainable business model being exposed quickly through social media alter managerial incentives to not embark on such trajectories? I, I, I don't know. I, I would have to... to... To, to think on that because you know unsustainable business models that that's you know I yeah. the, super, the supervisor they identify this thing and they ask for remediation Let, let's not forget i mean these guys didn't have a, a chief risk officer for nine months i understand i mean it, it was uh some of these things uh, were really uh, uh, absurd i would say uh, normally a bank should have time to remediate i mean if you know uh here um so, so if you expose too quickly, you may even destroy good business models. I mean, I, I, uh, I, I have to think more about that. So. Okay. With this, with food for thought, this is what we actually, that's what we, uh, what we intended to provide here with our policy letter to stimulate a, a debate on um on the future of, uh, of bank regulation. So let me thank you. Let me thank the um our two discussants, Elke König and Lorenzo Bini-Smagi, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the audience, whom we cannot see, but they're out there, they're out there in numbers, and uh, thank you for your questions. Sorry that we couldn't answer all of them, um, but feel free to reach out to us uh, if you want to know more. We have our policy letter on the web, and let me just close with my personal view is that um, I think this was a welcome a wake up call, a welcomed wake up call to uh, remind us that um, markets are evolving. So regulation must evolve too. I don't think we can be complacent. We need to, I don't think it's fair to say this was imperfect or failed because we need to, um, you know, we need to progress and learn, learn the lessons. And um, with this, I would like to close our webinar and um, looking forward to future stimulating discussions in the future of uh, banking regulation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.